Hades Darwin listeners, love is blind. How do you feel? I'm happy and lucky that I'm the man that gets to read this. I don't know if I can tell you exactly what you want to hear at this point. Okay, so right now, Jimmy and Jessica are meeting, and Jessica is all in on Jimmy, and Jimmy is trying to decide between Jessica and Chelsea. He's shown some signs that he avoids. You know, on on one hand, you would say that he's just very reserved, or he is even keeled, or he doesn't show emotion very much, or he doesn't like emotion. But I think there might be some issue here for him because the situation calls for clear communication and emotion. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, A lot of times people surprise me uh, uh, because there's just not much data to go off of. But we'll keep an eye on that. And the landscape is that I think Jimmy, well, he's on the fence, but so, yeah, I I think he is legit on the fence. I think he is thinking, wow, I'm into Jessica and I'm I'm into Chelsea. And I get, so on one hand, it could just be a really hard decision, right? He doesn't have a lot of time. These kind of big life decisions are frequently mulled over for months, if not years. It It can take a long time to come to a place where you feel like, you're solid on, on a decision, you know? So that that's normal. But on another hand, I wonder if he is avoiding, uh, avoiding thinking about it, avoiding pulling the trigger, or he doesn't have access to his emotions, so he can't really evaluate which option he wants or is, you know, leaning towards. So, so I don't know. But he seems to be choosing Jessica, really, up until this point anyway. And so Jessica is being pretty clear to him, like, I'm all in on you, so what's what's the deal? And he's uh, being coy about it, and or he just legit doesn't know. I think he also is wanting to wait, right? Like, let's say that he, in his mind, he's like, yeah, I'm like 60% Jessica right now. But I am, I'm waiting to reveal that, and I don't know how to s- talk about it without revealing that I'm leaning in that direction. That's the way it kind of looks to me, but I, I don't know. I'm really emotional and I got a lot to think about. And I don't know what he means by I'm really emotional because he's not showing any emotion. Now, people can have a lot of emotion without showing much emotion, but it's just something that's of note. If I had a client that presented this way, I, I would take note of it. I, I don't know what it would mean exactly, but, and plus that, that label of I'm feeling emotional. I'm not a huge fan of people saying that because typically what they mean is they're crying, they're sad. I'm getting emotional, right? And I find that that reduces emotion, the word emotion, the concept of, emo- of emotion to just tears coming out of your face. Because of course you can be sad and not cry. I don't chastise people for it, but I just, of course, you know, the broader issue is just, I just wish our culture was a lot more mature and human about our approach to emotion in general. But in this context, he's saying, I'm very emotional. I, I think what he's talking about is he's worried. He's like in a bind. He doesn't want to hurt people's feelings, I think. And he's worried he's going to make the wrong choice. And there's a lot of pressure. So I think that's what he means by emotional. But I I think he could do well, and maybe he will, by just saying, hey, uh, you are uh, definitely at the top of my list. I I know you know that someone else is up there too. And I I just need a little bit of time, please, if if that's okay. And I'm sorry that I'm doing this to you. I, I feel horrible. You know, just something along those lines. Maybe he will. I'm trying to get to a point where I know for sure. Mm hmm. And I do want you to know for sure. Feel how you feel and do that unapologetically. And good on Jessica. You know, it'd be hard. It'd be hard to be in those shoes. So for her to suck it up and be differentiated and say, yeah, okay, I want you to be sure. I don't want to pressure you to make a decision. I want you to want me. 
as the cheap chick cheap trick song goes. Even if you don't feel the same way, which I cannot believe my mouth is uttering those words, but regardless, I can leave feeling like I did and said everything. And by the way, I don't know if I showed this footage of her talking about her childhood, but just to fill you in, because some people don't watch the show or it's you might even be watching this years from the time that I'm recording this. And a little background on Jessica. She tells us her biolog she refers to him as biological parents, struggled with drug addiction, she said. Her father went to prison when she was about four years old. And then she said the mom spiraled. And I'm guessing that either means mental illness, depression, further into drug addiction, I'm not sure. But she went into foster care, which usually means that there was such a, a, a significant amount of neglect, possibly abuse, of Jessica that the authorities were contacted multiple times. You know, there's a myth out there that Child Protective Services is just champing at the bit to take children out of the home. That is just not the case. There are situations where one CPS call will result in that, but the circumstances have to be particular, typically. And, you know, I I'm generalizing because in every jurisdiction around the United States is a different set of humans who are working for Child Protective Services. It's sort of like generalizing about police officers, right? There's a lot of different human beings and a lot of different cultures and leaderships and, and you know, pockets of differences. But generally speaking, Child Protective Services doesn't take children out of the home and place them into a foster home for small reasons. And typically, because I have worked with families like this, the government would actually hire me to go into the home to try to fix the situation such that the child wouldn't need to be uh, taken out of the home because that's a very expensive thing for the government. And two, it is very disruptive for the family, obviously. It's also stripping the parents of their rights, which the government isn't quick to do. And I was also involved uh, they, the government would hire me to actually go into the home to reunite the children with the with the parents after they, perhaps if the, it was a drug addiction issue, they had uh, gone through recovery and sufficiently demonstrated to the government that they were clean and complying with treatment. And so my point is, is that when I hear a story like that, where she was placed in, into foster care, in all likelihood, you know, on average, she went through a lot of neglect at the very least, and possibly abuse as well. Even prior to the father going into prison, right? And oftentimes the environment for a family like this, where you have two parents that are in that life, there can be a lot of questionable individuals that are invited into the home. The child is exposed to a lot of things and possibly victimized by all sorts of people. I've heard it all from all different angles. I've heard it from the clients as children. I've heard it from the clients as adults. I've heard it from the parents. I've heard it from the officials. I've heard it from the police. I've heard it in court. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's serious stuff and it's hard. I don't know if that happened to her, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was at least somewhat in that direction. Anyway, so then we hear she goes into foster care and then her dad got out of prison and she lived with him. I don't know how old she was then, but I'm I'm thinking that was a while later. And also the feeling that children have in situations like that. It's like, well, I have parents, but they're not taking care of me right now. And even the father in prison, children will uh, conclude that as a child, they're not good enough so that the parent would refrain from engaging in behaviors that would land them in prison. You know, children will, will personalize it. And of course, the mother spiraling, again, the child could say, I'm not a good enough child. I'm not a good enough person for my mom to stick around and take care of me. So that, that you know, that not all children interpret it that way. And if the child has enough help therapy or support system, maybe a grandparent to be there to demonstrate otherwise the child can be protected in that way. But uh, there's always some sort of 
uh, uh, harm that happens psychologically to children in situations like that, or I don't know if always, but frequently. So anyway, the dad gets out, she goes to live with the dad, and then he killed himself. And recovery from suicide is very difficult for loved ones. It, you know, when someone suddenly dies of any reason, it can be obviously very, very hard. And just imagine from her perspective, she's like, I finally got my dad back and then he dies. And again, children will interpret it like I'm, if I were a better person, if I had saved him from the stress, he would still be alive. So not only am I a bad person and he abandoned me, he gave up on parenting and didn't love me enough because I'm not good enough, but I'm, I'm not good enough to save people. You know, I, I don't know. She doesn't show any signs of this kind of stuff, but I'm just telling you like typical things. So not only is the loss difficult just in general, but suicide can be particularly difficult. And especially if it's violent, which it often is, the, even if you weren't there, the vision of it, right? The, the, the sort of recreation that you make in your mind regarding the details that you might have heard. And then, of course, if you witness the body, you know, it's very, very hard. And then uh, that happens, and she goes back into foster care. And this foster family is very loving, apparently, and secure for her. And then they adopted her at age 16. And then she got pregnant at 17. And she said that if she wasn't in, uh, adopted, then the child would have been taken away from her as a ward of the state, right? So she's really grateful that they adopted her so that she can have her child, right? And yeah, I, I've worked with a lot of families and teens that have that exact background. And they can sometimes, due to their attachment issues and you know, being a teenager is hard anyway, but imagine having that kind of history and that kind of stigma, then sometimes you're just looking for some way to feel good enough or loved, and you might walk into relationships quickly and make decisions that result in unwanted pregnancies. Or because of your history, you are attracted or used to people who don't treat you well, and you find someone that doesn't take precautions regarding pregnancies. I don't know. Maybe it was a planned pregnancy. Somehow I doubt it. But uh, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a very common story. And I'm saying all this because she is showing a lot of health and differentiation and kindness. And you know, she's 28, which is pretty young in my book. And given that history, it would be hard for anyone to go through what she's going through because she's like, I loved, I think she legit loves Jimmy. It's not like, well, we'll see kind of, because I, I get the sense for some people when they get to the engagement, they are thinking, well, I'm kind of into this person enough. You know, I could see it really working and I'm excited, you know, but we'll see. Whereas other people, I think they are locked in during the pods and Think, I'm thinking she's more the second. You know, think of like when in, sh in season two, when Shayna committed to, I can't remember the guy's name because, you know, Shayna was going after Shane and then Shane went with Natalie and then Shayna was like, oh, I'll pick this other guy. And then she met him. And then that, that night after meeting this other guy, she leaves the, the whole situation. <laughs> she's like, yeah, nah. And if you were really, really in love, then at the very least, you would give it a little bit more time, right? So I think some people are more on the fence and waiting and seeing, which would be okay. It's like, well, yeah, I think, you know, I've had enough time to think to think that this might work out, but I'm not quite sure. So it's a really hard situation for her. And she has the maturity and the compassion and the empathy to one, pay attention to her needs. You know, she's asserting herself and stating what she wants. And at the same time, she is saying to Jimmy, yeah, do what you got to do. I, I don't want to, you to be in a bad position. I want you to want me. And I also don't want to pressure you. You know, it's just, it's really great. Like those are something I need to think about. And that's because you have autumn. I don't want you to think that I'm not happy and thankful and like, I don't feel like the luckiest man in the world that you <laughs> shared that with me. 
So he says that he has to think really long and hard about committing to Jessica because she has Autumn, her her daughter. And yeah, absolutely. But the way he's wording it, it could be hurtful, (laughs) but could reveal his mindset, right? You know, there's nothing wrong with someone saying, oh, I'm not ready for that yet, right? I want to have kids, but not for a while after getting married. I'm just not at that place. And that's a big commitment. You know, another thing that I was wondering about, because I feel like this might be one of the first times this has happened. Uh, I'm guessing there were other cast members who had children, but they didn't make it to the altar. Anyway, I think it's odd that anyone, either person, Jimmy or Jessica, would head toward engagement prior to Jimmy and Autumn actually getting to know each other, right? Because that's a a very important relationship to suss out, you know, especially if you're Jessica, you're just like, I, I don't know what this guy is like around kids. I don't know if my daughter and him are going to get along. We, we got to figure that out, right? Now, maybe Jessica's thinking, well, we, we go on the getaway and then we have a, some period of time, a month-ish, where we can actually live our lives. And at that point, I can suss it out. And if things go horribly, then I'll just say no at the altar, I guess. But it is it is interesting. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's what people are thinking. I guess it would just be really important for people in Jessica's shoes, and I'm guessing Jessica would be thinking this, that, okay, absolutely, I'm locked in, everything's great, there's an asterisk here. <laughs> and maybe even Jessica would say that to Jimmy, he's just like, I'm all in, but we got to get Autumn's uh, uh, approval here, and I, and I have to see the two of you together. And if that doesn't go well, no matter how much I love you and want to be with you, my daughter comes first, that kind of thing. So there's that. But anyway, it, it, you know, it's fine that he is considering that. But the way he words it, I hope he says something here of, of uh, like, because the way he's wording it, it, it's almost like treating Jessica like she's she has baggage or she isn't good enough or, you know, like it's a deficit or something. You know, it's one thing if it's just... I don't know where I'm at with kids. That, that's a I, I, it's a hard thing. It's a huge decision, and I want to. You know, I'm not saying you're you're substandard as a as a dating partner, but it's just a big decision. You know, I was like, how would you word that? Um, I don't know. Just something more. But he's so reserved that I worry that with his limited communication, that Jessica would interpret it in the negative way and maybe it is the negative way i don't know what do you think you're welcome bud like i don't know what what... don't bud me (laughs) that's crazy i'm gonna be honest with you i don't like this like at all yeah they're playing the tense music but I think, well, we'll see where this heads, but I think what all that she's saying is, I don't like this. <laughs> you're in this state of not talking much, and I think what you're saying is you're still on the fence about me and Chelsea, uh, right? That's her name, <laughs> Chelsea. Um, and I'm trying to play ball here, but I'll be honest, this isn't my preference. I would rather have you just pick me. Because you don't feel the same way? Which, if you haven't noticed by now, like, I'm a big girl. If that's how you feel, just say that. I'd prefer prefer our dates to be our dates and not talk about where my head's at picking. Yeah, I, I understand where she's coming from. And it would be normal for her to have that as an option. And it, it is an option. She could think, if you're holding back because you want to save my feelings, don't worry about it. Just lay it on the line. I don't think that's what's happening. I think he is legit just on the fence. But then he says, I want our dates to be just about us and not about anybody else. Okay, yeah, in the beginning. But that is the primary question for everybody, including Jessica. Who is Jimmy going to pick? So it's very normal. It'd be weird if they didn't reference it on some level. And I think Jimmy 
if he wanted to move on with the date to do other kinds of things that are not related to this directly, I think he would do well by just explaining a little bit more, like what I was saying earlier. I'm not going to jump the gun and tell any woman I love them. I'm not asking you to tell me that you love me. You I know, but I, I, when I when I love someone, I freaking love someone. Like I'm like you're gonna get every inch of everything we've talked about in the ways I love. Yeah, I think he's not understanding. I think he thinks that she's saying that she wants him to commit to her now, and she's upset about that. I I don't. I mean, I'm. Sh it wouldn't be weird for her to have that impulse, but I don't think that's what she's saying. All she's saying, like all he had to say right there is. No, 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 it's not that. I, I'm not saying that I, I'm i secretly wanting to break up with you or something. No, I, I, I am like, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, I'm in the process of, of trying to figure out which one. And I'm, I'm like definitely thinking you might be the one. So believe me, I'm on the fence. I'm really unsure about what to do. Or God, it's a hard thing. <laughs> It's a hard, hard way. But I don't know. I just imagine that if he just said something more, a little bit more reassuring without saying that he's committing to her, I think it might assuage and then they could just move on to something else. I'm not doing that with someone else. I'm not, I'm not doing that with you. I know what you wanted here and I, I want to say that, but it's unfair for me to even say anything to you about how I feel if I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to be on a knee for you. So he's saying it's unfair if I say anything, and I don't think that that's true. I think he could do well by just explaining where he's at a little bit more. He said he has said very little about what is going on in his mind and in his heart, and he has this pattern. He, I didn't mention it the first time it happened or the first couple times that. There was this frequent phrase he would say, or maybe it just happened once, where he he's like, can we change the subject? Like when he was talking to Chelsea when it kind of blew up, if I remember, when she mentioned that she had been married before, right? Yeah. And then he started to kind of clam up, and he's like, can we change the subject? And, and Chelsea's like, I, I don't think we can. Or it was something like that. And it was a little bit of a red flag that he has some amount of pathological avoidance and is very uncomfortable. You know, Jimmy right now might look very calm and cool and unemotional, but for some people, due to the way they were raised, they might have even more emotion than you could possibly imagine, but they don't show it because they had to not show it because of the circumstances of their childhood, either... They were being neglected or abused or some circumstance, ignored. And so they not only have a lot of emotion and they don't show it, but because they don't show it and they probably weren't showing it since the age of 18 months old, they've never had any of their emotions felt and responded to. So not only do they have the in, in the moment distress, but they have a lifetime of residual distress that they've never processed or expelled. And so strangely, the most stoic and even keeled people can sometimes be the most chaotically emotional. Well, that's absolute literal blasphemy. And I don't agree with that because I- Wait, blasphemy? Uh, did I miss something? That's your mind. Well, that's absolute literal blasphemy, and I don't agree with that because I told you how I felt knowing good and well, and I'm still okay with the fact that you might not feel the same way. Yeah, I think they're on the same page, but they're just arguing, and I don't understand this blasphemy thing. I think, so for us therapists, particularly us couple therapists, we are trained and we are in a habit of paying attention to process rather than the content, rather you know, rather than the verbatim words, which especially in conflict are often completely unrelated to what the actual conflict is about. You know, you'll hear people, maybe yourself, that you have a fight with your spouse, and the next day after things calm down, you're thinking about how did that fight happen? What were we fighting about? And almost always people will think to themselves or tell me that the fight was over nothing or it started over something really silly. And yeah, 
in terms of the content, in terms of the verbatim conversation, yeah, it was silly and doesn't make sense. But if you understand the process and the emotion and the attachment and the security, what's happening, the triggering that's happening on the inside, it, it's very logical and is not silly at all. I think what's happening for the two of them is this verbal conversation that it doesn't really make any sense because they're basically, you know, she just basically said the same thing. It's like, yeah, I, I, I'm okay with you being on the fence. I'm just waiting for you to make a choice. And then he's saying, I'm trying to make a choice. So I, I don't know what exactly they're arguing about. And I don't know what she means by blasphemy. Blasphemy, I mean, it's a, like a religious word, right? So is that just her stand-in word for... I don't like this. Is, is that a cultural thing that people do? There's a lot of cultural notions that feel very, very foreign to me. Things about gender, things about, you know, this, this blasphemy word. <laughs> I don't know. Again, I'm sure people in my town have various different ways of talking that I would be confused by, but they're just, uh, it, as I'm watching this season, my dog is barking, there have been little moments where I'm, I'm like, Am I watching a show from the United States? It, it just, the way that some of them talk, I'm like, where, where does that come from? Anyway, uh, uh, not judging, just like, I feel like I don't understand. Like when Matthew was talking, <laughs> and there's other kind of words, I'm just like, what? I, 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 I'm having this a, a reminiscent feeling that I get when I watch shows, like when we watch 90 Day Fiance or something, and they're in the other country, and there will be this operating understanding among the families or the individuals that is very, very foreign to me, but I understand that because it's a different country and a different culture. But when I think about Americans, you know, of course, there's a lot of cultures in the United States, but I feel like I have enough familiarity with most of the mainstream cultures in the United States to feel, anyway, I'm not saying they're drastically different, but I don't know. Point is, is What's that blasphemy thing? Do you know? <laughs> Maybe she'll explain it. But anyway, the emotional situation, I think, is that Jimmy is frozen in uh, indecision. And I think he's also frozen in worries. I'm implying this, or I'm inferring it, but he, I think, is frozen in guilt and doesn't want to be blamed because he doesn't know what to do. He feels pressure... Uh, from Jessica and Chelsea, and he feels bad, but he also feels like, but I didn't, I'm not doing anything wrong. If, if he, he feels kind of stuck, and he doesn't know how to navigate his way out of it. He, he particularly doesn't know how to explain it, but he might not even know how to process it. So, so I think he's kind of frozen. And what that does to Jessica, given the landscape, is that it makes a, a a feeling that she's having, which would be normal, which is rejection and worry and hurt, it, it, it makes it 10 times worse because when she does get a chance to interact with him, he's like this this absent ghost. <laughs> and so that's what is, I think, true. And she it keeps saying things to him. You know, I think in the past, she would have been leading the way in the conversation. And now that they're in this landscape, you know, earlier in this this date, we see her not saying much and waiting for him to say something. <laughs> and since he doesn't usually do that and didn't do it then, she's getting more aggravated because at the very least, hey, pal, like the ball's in your court. I've already committed. Where's the reciprocation or where's the decision? Because you know, I, like I could see Jessica saying, look, I want to have this date, but it's too painful. I can't have it if I am in this state. It just feels so bad. So I, I guess I'm just going to ask that we end this date and that if you, whoever you choose, let me know. I, I can't go on with this until I know. I think what he's thinking is I need more data to make a decision. And we haven't had much time already and I want as much time as possible. And I think they're in that phase toward the end of the week where they will have these really long dates and you know they get there in the morning and then they stay till late at night and you know he might be thinking okay I'll, I'll spend you know 6 hours with Jessica then I'll spend 6 hours with Chelsea and 
that will give me more data to make a decision. You know, I'll, let's sort of have more experience with each person. You know, it makes sense. I think he's in that position. I think that's what he's planning to do, but he's not explaining and he's not reassuring. <laughs> it's all just this blank. And I think it might actually illuminate a dynamic in their relationship that Jessica actually is benefiting by witnessing because this won't be the if they do get married this wouldn't be the last this won't be the this won't be the last time where he gets frozen and shut and get, and shuts down and is unable to empathize or take care of other people because he's just frozen right now a little bit of that is reasonable but you would think there would especially with how much time they spend in these states you think there'd just be a little bit of of care and so you know he's doing his best to explain it and then she says it's blasphemy and you know she i think she's escalating because her differentiation was really was top notch at the beginning and i think she's starting to lose that which is totally normal uh, um, the model of differentiation put forth by murray bowen and others you can listen to my deep dives on that. But I believe it was Murray Bowen himself who discussed this in the 60s and 70s, that when you return home to your family of origin and you're trying to be differentiated, you, you've gone through a lot of therapy and you have achieved a really high level of differentiation. Differentiation meaning that you can manage to evaluate the situation and your emotions and your needs well enough to make choices of behavior and otherwise so that it's an optimal outcome or it's a it's a reasonable prediction of an out, of of a of a of an optimal outcome like you are at thanksgiving and your dad starts to be annoying and you've got like another hour and a half at the, at the house, at, at your parents' house. And you have this impulse to confront your dad at, at the dinner table. And you're just, you just, you'd wanna say like, dad, you're doing it again. Like you do this every time, but then you stop. And this is where differentiation comes in. You, you sort of pull away from that urge and you look at it and you think, okay, where's this coming from? Is that a rational choice? And what's what's my emotion? What are my needs? Uh, what am I thinking right now? What are the facts? What's what's everyone else going to feel if I do that? What would be the predicted outcome if I did do that? And then you make a choice. And maybe you make a choice to confront. And maybe you make a choice to not. It just depends on your evaluation in that moment and the ability to differentiate and sift through all that and take the time and that could just be a split second or it could be 10 minutes. You, you know, you could pull away from the table and call your friend or something. Um, you know, sort of like dial a friend or what is it on how to be a millionaire? Um, maybe everyone should have that on Thanksgiving. <laughs> dial a therapist. So that's differentiation. And so uh, the model is that at, at the pinnacle of differentiation with a ton of therapy, a ton of recovery, you can hold on for your differentiated state for about a half an hour when you are in a high tense emotional situation. So it's not expected that you would be able to manage past a certain time limit, right? So maybe for her, she, you know, she was able to manage for a while, but the pain is building up and the hurt is building up. Because, you know, he hasn't really said anything definitive he, he and he he hasn't said anything to and they don't have the benefit of of the nonverbal which i think would be particularly hard for jessica because he doesn't say anything and if he doesn't say anything then it would be easy to imagine that he's just sitting over there without a care in the world just blank right um whereas that maybe if she saw him with his hands it would help her to, oh, okay, he's, you know, he's, his gears are turning or something. I don't know. I cannot give you anything else at this point. I have very strong feelings for you, and I want you to know that. You've literally poured your heart into this, and, like, 
okay, good. So he finally said something, and you see her going, okay, I think that's what she's like. All right, that's what I was waiting for. All right, well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.